but it's the same person, and he just covers his mouth when he wants to act like the other person. Mm-hmm. Who's who would be the one covering his mouth? I think it's you. Why? I think I just have a better voice, crisper voice. But do you kind of want to explain this so we can kind of see where we get the idea for this podcast from, just in general? So explain my article? Yeah. Explain my paper. Okay, so recently for a philosophy independent study that I was taking as a, as a, as a college course, I wrote a, I wrote a paper. 22 page paper. Yeah, 22 page paper, double spaced, um, about Genesis 3 and the fall. And in this paper, I essentially discuss discuss the fall, discuss one the initial conditions of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and you know because they hadn't sinned yet, that it wasn't that they could be uh, tempted through sin. And a lot of people talk about how sin is a power and how sin corrupts, and how how sin has an immediate effect on what we're thinking of right now. And because we are fallen. Right, it's so much easier to sin each time we do. But Adam and Eve weren't like this. No, they were created perfectly uh, because of God's a perfect Creator. So I talk about the initial conditions that they were facing. I talk about secondly the temptation that they faced and sort of the strategy behind what the serpent was asking them and what he was challenging them to do. And then I talk about. Uh, the death that God says would result as a result of of breaking his commandment and eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then finally, I talk about the hope of restoration, how it is that maybe we can't come back to God, but he comes back to us. And this gives us restoration. This gives us redemption. And yeah, I, I titled the essay, So Will I? Uh, that it's It's... The title is "So Will I?" question mark, but I, I say "So Will I," and it's a it's a spoof. Would I say spoof? Is that the right word? Illusion. It's a, okay. Sure. It's I'm getting the title for my essay from the from the the Hillsong United song "So Will I," uh, that goes "God of Creation" there at the start before the beginning of of time, and I think it's a pretty fitting song for this because. This song essentially talks about how creation praises God because it does, right? Creation praises God stoically, and it just it displays His wonder, but uh, not because it chooses to. And so, the the song has this lyric: "If the stars were made to worship, so will I." And that's interesting. Uh, and in in the paper I write, so the central of the the central idea of the song troubles me. Quote, if the stars were made to worship, so will I, end quote. The stars do not have a choice, do they? Through a series of intricate chemical reactions, they shine persistently and speak volumes of the Creator's majesty, but not because they will to do so. The stars are amoral. They fulfill their purpose out of sheer fate and design. But we, as humans, are moral beings. That is, we must make the decision to worship the Creator. We have the choice to be who He created us to be. So if the stars are made to worship, so will I. Well, will I? It's my choice. And and then, I mean, this actually leads really well into our first question. Yeah, and so uh, as I was going to ask you, and my answer to this you kind of already touched on, but what separates us from everything else in creation, other animals? What separates us from that? Okay, so this is this is a really tough topic to, to answer, do you have any first thoughts on it? Do you, what, what's your immediate thought? Like, what separates? Based on, I don't know, what you've read in philosophy, what you've read in Genesis, what people have told you and what people think, what, do you, what is the common reaction to this question, what separates us from animals, and then what do you think? Well, there's a lot of different answers that people go to. One being that our sense of the future is much more concrete than that of animals. Animals, they can plan for the immediate future, but we don't see them plan for the long-term future. Okay. Now, that's not necessarily mean that they can't. 
Maybe they can. I don't know. I'm not very convinced by that argument. Okay. Um, is that what what the common argument is? Is that the only thing that separates us from animals is how far ahead in our lives we plan for? Not the only thing, but some people say language, like the, the depth and complexity of human language is so much greater than that of animals that that is what separates us from animals. Okay. Um, and meaning the complexity of language, not just, hey, look out, there's a predator coming. More right. so, we can tell stories about other people. Some other people say the abstraction, our ability to abstract principles from what we see okay. is what separates us from animals. And I think that's probably the closest to my answer. Is that we have the capacity to act abstract things from what abstract we see? Abstract principles from observations and what what exactly does that mean that means that we see that this activity let's say killing your neighbor for fun we see that that leads to a lot of bad consequences okay and we see that killing um someone else not maybe not your neighbor but um Maybe like someone in your family just just cuz we see that that's bad, and so being able to take all these different in, in like uh, all these different aspects of it and say, oh, well, murder's bad. Okay, so you're saying our ability to label things as good and bad is what separates us from animals. Well, it's also being able to draw out what we should label as good or bad. So okay. what I really come to is that we are moral creatures. That's good. I, I think that's really interesting. And when you say moral creatures, do you mean that? Do you, do you mean by moral the categories of good and evil? So the way I think of it, I relate the word morality to simply the categorizing of things between good and evil. And as moral beings, therefore, we have the capacity to categorize different things between good and evil. Yeah. Okay. And. So when I say we're immoral beings, like if I say that someone is an immoral person, I'm, I'm saying his behavior is bad, right? If I'm saying yeah. someone is a moral person, not a moral being, but a moral person, I'm saying for the most part his beha- behavior is good. Yeah. Okay, and so if I say something is amoral, like one word amoral, one word, one word amoral, what does that mean? It means they, know, they have no concept of what of, morality of what morality is of what is good and what is okay, bad. Okay, yeah, but let me ask you the question then. Okay. What's morality? I think morality is the category. I'm, I'm just going off the top of my head because I, I wasn't prepared for this. It's just what we were just talking about is the categories of good and evil. The categories of good and evil? Yeah. Okay. Can you explain more? Because that doesn't really make any sense. I, I don't know how to classify it. I I would just say morality is good and evil as related to human behavior. So does that mean that animals can't do anything good or evil? I would say animals are amoral. Yeah. So it's the capacity to do good and evil. Okay. It's what makes a creature moral as opposed to amoral. Okay, yeah, I think so. Okay. So, where did we get that capacity from? Oh, where did we get that capacity? Yes, and in the context of Genesis 3, did we have that capacity before the fall? Interesting. That's tough. So I'll start with the second question, and if you can just remember that first question, because I'm probably going to f- forget it. What, where did we get the capacity from? Yeah, and did we have it before the fall? Or not? Did we have it before the fall? Okay. Oh, okay, where to start? Okay, I, I, I'll say I like your, I like what you're doing here. I like your definition, and different categories of. Uh, or saying that people are different from animals and that they have the capacity to abstract certain principles from 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 ideas and from actions and classify them as good or bad. I think that is related 
to what makes us different from animals. But I think in the first place, as God created man, he created man in his image, right? Okay. And I think this is specifically what separates us from other living creatures. What part of being created in God's image is the qualitative difference? Between us and animals? Yeah. Or what does it really mean? Okay, so... Yeah, I, I can I can hit on that. Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes a book called Creation and Fall. And in this book, Creation and Fall, he talks about essentially the process of creation and how man got from his perfectly created state to his fallen state and how it was by man's choice and that he got to this state. What he says is that uh, when God created the heavens and the earth and he created everything up until man... What he says is God, right, does not recognize himself in his work at this point. Despite the glory of the galaxies and the intricacy of the smallest particle, the work is dead. That is, while it comes out of freedom, it is itself not free, but determined. So what does this mean? This means that so far creation fulfills its purpose, right, of, of being who God created it to be. That's what it means to fulfill your purpose is to be who God created you to be. That, that, that is your ultimate purpose. And so far, creation fulfills its purpose, not out of love for the creator, but because of sheer design. Right? God designed the sun to shine, but he didn't give the choice to the sun whether it would shine or not. It's just going to shine. Yeah. Right? He designed the rivers to flow, mm -hmm. and he, but he didn't give the choice of the water Will I flow or not? No, he, the, the water just flows, right? It, it is out of sheer design that the water flows and fulfills its purpose, thereby glorifying its creator because it's doing what it was created to do. So at, the, at this point, as, as God creates prog progressively uh, more and more and more, we see more complex creatures come into being. So he, yep. he creates from the... Non move, he, yeah. He creates rocks, he creates non moving things to plants, which and then, are living but non moving, and then the and animals, fish, and then, and then um, fish and birds, and then finally, and then land finally, land animals, and then right? Humans, so it moves more and more and more complex until we get to man. And at this point, God says, Let us create man in our own image. What does that mean? That means that God is about to give man the choice to do what, what he was created to do or not. And, okay, so... So, so what you're saying is the choice is the part of God's image that dwells in us that is what creates us as moral creatures. I Okay, sure, the, you can use the word choice, but I'd prefer to use the word freedom. Okay. Right, and I use this example in the book. God before creating the world, was completely free from the world. Right? He, mm -hmm. he was not obliged. He was not necessitated. He was not required to create the world in any sense whatsoever. Sort of like, um, and I use this example in my article, there's a, there's a chain of dominoes. And it, for each domino that falls, you can say, okay, what caused that domino to fall? Oh, it's the one that hit it beforehand. And then so on and so on and so on until you get to the initial domino. And you ask, what caused that domino to fall? Well, there was a person who struck it, right? And and in this sense, you ask this person, what caused you to strike it? And he said, I have the choice, right? Mm -hmm. I was free from this chain of dominoes. I was completely free from this scenario. Mm -hmm. And I had the choice of whether to strike it or not. So what I'm saying here is nothing forced God to create man. It wasn't that God was lonely, right? He was existing in relationship with himself as a trinity mm -hmm. for eternity right and we don't even understand what that means we're just thinking of really 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 long time but he was already existing in himself before he created time okay yeah. so we're going to conceive of him through the medium that we that we think in which is time but keep in mind he created time okay so god is completely free from everything he creates he didn't have to but he did he did create us he did give us being okay Okay, and so that's what God's freedom is, is not being necessitated, not being required at all to create mankind. Um, and, and so what does this mean for us? That means that if God wants to create man in his own image, he's going to have to give man this freedom as well. Okay. 
So he's, he's going to somehow endow man with this freedom, this choice. And how does this cho- choice take place? Well, this choice takes place for, for us in the sense that we have the ability to choose whether or not we, we will, right? Whether or not we will be who God created us to be, whether or not we will be uh, the people that God created us to be, the moral agents that God created us to be. We can choose to reject all this. We can, yeah. we can and in that sense, we're, we are not being who God created us to be. And why does he do this? Why does he give us a choice? What is so special about having the freedom? Precisely because we have the freedom we're able to act out of love. And I think here's where we, here's where it gets like, I mean, if it wasn't confusing before, it gets even more confusing now. What does this mean? That freedom results to love. So think of a, um, I was reading the story of Esther this morning and King Xerxes, 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 that's a hard word. Xerxes. 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 King Xerxes, right, had uh, had a queen, and then he removed her from her position, and he brought Esther to be his queen. That's a nice way of putting it. And right, <laughs> and essentially, what he what he says to Esther is, "Okay, you're going to be my wife, not because you choose me, but because I tell you you're going to be my wife." And I think about that, and I think. Okay, does that mean their relationship was based on love or it was based on obligation? And see, there's a difference between the two. Because if, if Esther would have chosen King Xerxes to be his to be her husband, right? And just like he chose her to be her wife, you would have this mutual love between the two. You would have this mutual bond of love that's created through freedom, through having the choice okay. of, of choosing someone or not. Think about this. If you're in a relationship with someone and you say... I love you, right? And the person says, oh, that's so sweet. And then, you know, the person who said I love you says, well, I don't really mean it. Someone's just holding a gun to the back of my head and telling me to say I love you. <sighs> does, that, does that take something away from the statement I love you? Yes, it does. Well, Because it, you were forced to say I love you. It takes it away because you said I don't really mean it, but... Okay, I mean, you can think about this. like, No, you have to ask yourself, do you really mean it? I think that's right. Do you really mean it? But whenever you take away the free choice, right? And whenever you obligate someone, you necessitate someone of uh, to to love you, to to enter into a relationship with you. It's not the same. There's n- there's not love anymore. It's just requirement, right? That's why the sun can't love God. The waters can't love God. The wind can't love God because they have they don't have the choice to blow. They don't have the choice to flow, and the sun doesn't have the choice to shine. But we do have the choice to obey God. And in having the choice to obey God, we also have the capacity to enter into a loving relationship with Him. Okay. Right? And I think that's the essence of this here is that in endowing us with freedom and creating us in His image, we have the capacity to make free choices, and we also have the capacity to love. Right. Okay. And so, how does this take place then? What does it What does it mean? What did God have to do in order to create man and woman in His own image? Well, He had to give them a limitation. He had to give them something to choose between. Right. Okay. And so He did this in in the form of, and this is what we were going to talk about: the commandment not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay. Okay. So, God creates them and he says you have the freedom you have the free choice to choose between me yeah or disobeying me right and he doesn't tell them what's going to happen if they disobey he doesn't tell them all the evil that's going to enter into the world all the suffering you must not eat it or or you will die. die but do they know what that means yet i don't think they do I don't think they know what it means to die because they haven't experienced it yet. They haven't seen it yet. They haven't seen the corruption that okay. death brings you. Okay. So they so, just they just think something will happen if we do it. Okay. Right? But they don't know exactly what it is. They don't know the pain that will follow. Because keep in mind they hadn't they haven't tasted yeah. that evil. Okay, yet. okay. Can I can I say something? Yeah. Okay. So what I think the reason why I think God chose to put the tree of knowledge of good and evil, what I think the knowledge of good and evil is, is Viewing eternity. 
That's kind of how I see it. Okay, what do you mean by that? I mean, when they eat of the knowledge of good and evil, they are able then to extrapolate their actions into the future. They're able to say, oh, this separation from God in eternity, like, uh, I think Tim Keller talks about um, hell being if you took your facing away and running away from God to eternity, you would be infinitely afar from him. Right. And so they're able to see what would happen to them. They're able to see how infinitely far away is. They understand what it means to die, and that is to be separated from God. That's interesting. I don't know quite how to how to take that yet. You, it's you're onto something because having the ability to look into the future, right, also implies that there's a past that's behind us. Yeah, I think I think that's true. And Soren Kierkegaard in his book, the concept of anxiety discusses how it before the before the human race right before adam and eve ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil the race didn't have a history and he talks about how sexuality right and the ability to reproduce actually comes as a result look at the curse that god gives eve in pain you will bear children right in yeah. pain you will have you will have labor and he he talks about how sexuality and and like Adam and Eve, maybe they wouldn't have children had they never eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The race would have remained one, right? The the race would have remained united between those two and God. That's interesting. And he says, because, however, they ate of the tree, they now have a history. Now the race has a history. And you have descendants being born. You have generations giving rise to generations, generations, yeah. generations. And then that also means that whenever we look at the curse that God places upon them, it, in light of, if we look at the tree, if we look at the fruit as being able to see the consequences of our actions, the curse that God places seems less of a curse and more of a prophecy. So right. he says that... Um, That's a good point. He says, Through painful toil you will eat fruit from it, talking about the ground, all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, You will, and you will eat the plants of the field. That's basically like the agricultural revolution. And this is the curse Meaning, he gives Adam, right? Yes. He's saying, hey, you now realize that you are going to die on this earth. You will die. You will return to dust. Right. You can now see that, can't you? Yes. Okay. And so you're going to have to try to stop that because you have this now anxiety produced from sin within you that you will want to stop that. And so you will do everything you can. You will work the ground to try to produce food and to eat of it. It says, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground since from it you were taken for dust you are into dust you will return. And so it's really just, it says their eyes were open. They know they're going to die and they don't want to. Right. That's really what I think it means. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I really like the statement you made how what this, this isn't so much a curse as much as it is the natural consequences of the action. Exactly. Right? So what is, what is Newton's law? Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So eating of the tree, in, in the metaphysical sense, the, the metaphysical act of eating of the tree has an equal and opposite metaphysical act, metaphor, metaphysical reaction to the initial act, which is what? Which is, so God created a system, and you can picture it like this. God created a system in this world, and I like to think of it like gears. So he created this entire system and there's a bunch of gears and we're the gear that's right in the middle of the whole thing and on which the whole thing hinges, okay? And then this gear broke itself. That's essentially what happens when Adam and, Adam and Eve eat of the tree. This gear breaks, right? And what happens to the rest of the system of the gears? Well, because it all hinges on this one gear, the rest of the system is going to fall prey to corruption. The rest of the system isn't going to work as it was initially intended to work. We're going to see nature, right? We're going to see nature itself 
suffer consequences. We're going to see death enter into the world. You can even argue that death wasn't in the world of animals until this happened. You, we're going to see evil not affect not only humans, but, but other parts of creation as well. And this is all because of, of, eating, of the, eating of the fruit of the tree. I don't know about the whole death not in animals thing yet. Yeah, that's that's also that, an interesting argument. That, I I don't I don't agree with that, but that's that's a that's a it's a different discussion. topic. I yeah, think I what I what, what I want to say is that corruption now enters into the world. And yeah, things do not and you work can say God that corruption, intended. in the view of nature, is our anthropomorphization of other animals, in a sense of we project our anxiety onto them. Okay, and so we think we see their suffering in light of our own. Okay, interesting. And so... Oh, okay, that's interesting. That's really interesting. And so, because before, if you talk about animals looking like not having the choice to worship God. Right, right then... Then... Then if God wills for them to die, then they die. Right? They don't care. And like being amoral, right, it, it doesn't mean anything. But if I mean, we not project... They care, but yeah. If we project our... If we anthropomorphize animals, or with, if we see them as being moral creatures, which a lot of us do, right, then we see them as being able to do good and evil. Which, and we see them also suffering. They see, we see them yes. affe- being affected by good and evil. Yes, and obviously pa- animals can feel pain, but that gets into is pain and suffering the same thing? Okay, and I don't think that it is, but. Another question. Yeah, that's, um, that's a whole different issue. So, whenever we are able to see the future, a way that sin, a way that sin perpetuates through that is that now we recognize our own weaknesses. And we want to cover up those weaknesses both physically, as Adam and Eve cover themselves. Right. And emotionally, we want to not let other people in. We don't trust other people. Right. And psychologically. So... We want to protect our own weaknesses because we now see what weaknesses we have. But that also means that we see what weaknesses other people have. And we know how to hurt other people physically, emotionally, spiritually. Yeah. And part of the knowledge of good and evil is then the knowledge of how to do evil. Okay. And so whenever we see our weaknesses we see others weaknesses and we can exploit that which as we've seen throughout history is done quite often okay um did you want to did you want to talk about the the death that god predicted would happen when they eat of the tree and that does happen as a result do i want to talk about the death yeah well what do you want to talk about it well I, i want to talk about how what the serpent promised man that he would be like God, yeah, is actually fulfilled, yeah. And but we aren't God, right? So, but we aren't God. And what's really interesting about this is that the serpent promises man that if you eat of this fruit, you will be like God. And I, what Nabil Qureshi, he's I listened to a lot of sermons he gave uh, a few years ago. But what he talks about is how us as humans do not have a light. A life source that's in ourselves sort of like uh, a television or computer has to be plugged in to a to a electric source in order to have life in order to function as it ought to function we do not have a life source that's in ourself instead our life source as we were created in god's image is in god himself god is what gives life and gives light to this image that he created being in us and so when we reject God and we disobey his commandment and we say, I don't trust you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this into my own hands, I'm going to eat of the tree, we turn away from this life source, right? The God, the one who creates life, the source of all life, if we turn away from him, what are we walking into? We're walking into death. Yeah. And that's, that's just, I think that's a perfect illustration, is just we have nowhere else to turn but to death and walking away from God. So yes, we are like God and that now we are expected to provide ourselves with our own life source because we have rejected God. We are expected to be the life source ourselves and to give ourselves our own life, 
Right? But, We're also expected to give definitions to things. Yep. We're expected to classify, okay, what is good and what is evil now? We're also expected to create and right. destroy like God. But right. But the, the fact of the matter is, and this is sort of a pun, the fact of the matter is that matter can neither be created or, nor destroyed. Right? And we, we observe that in science. We observe that in the scientific reality, in the physical reality that we see. We cannot create matter... Can we see that in the metaphysical reality as well? We cannot say to what is metaphysically and and actually bad, you are now good, right? And I, uh, you can bring a lot of political issues into this, but uh, I don't know. Take something. I don't. I don't want to do that. I think we see uh, in the abortion debate how the struggle is over definition right now. Yeah. The struggle is over. At okay. what point do we define life? Li- uh, r- right. At what point is the child in the womb life? And and so the issue is how do we define it? Right. So where do we get our definitions now? I never thought of it that way. So in the absence of God, we have to set our own definitions. And right. as we talked about a lot, especially in that Kierkegaard Nietzsche episode, we really can't. Right. It, it matter was, can neither be created nor destroyed, nor can yeah. metaphysical reality. We cannot define it. We cannot make it what we want it to be. Yeah. Right. We don't have that capacity. We can only name it. Yeah. We can. We can. We can call it what it is, but we, we can't can call it what it is. Make it I like that. Is. We see. We see what our actions, the consequences that they have when repeated over long periods of time. We see the structure of how, basically human society humans nature we can see how all that works but we can't change it right we can name it but we can't change it this is really interesting going back to genesis is that what did god create adam to do he gave adam a job in the garden of Mm Eden, and that was to name the animals right and adam is fulfilling his purpose when he names not when he makes the animals but when he names them when he labels them when he calls them what they are what god created them to be Yep. Right, and and so we see our ability to point things out and our ability to name things. Abstraction, right? abstract. Yeah, right. Good. I, th- the reason we can do that is because we were created with that purpose, but we were not created to redefine things, and we were not created to make our own matter. Yep. So on. Um, is there anything else you wanted to talk about? No, I think that kind of touches what I wanted to say. I think that was a good one. Meh. We'll see. Okay. All right. All right, bye. Bye.